Hello everyone and welcome to Public Live. I'm your host Anne Berry and here with you today to discuss the recent Fed decision to hike rates by 25 basis points. Feel free to check us out on Spotify at The Public Podcast and on YouTube at Public Invest for in-depth interviews to help keep your portfolio on track. Today we're here with Joseph Wang, CIO at Monetary Macro to break down the Fed minutes, Chairman Jerome Powell's recent press conference and the Fed's path beyond the ninth consecutive rate hike. Joseph, welcome to public. Hey, Anne, and hello, public. It's great to be here. So, Joseph, the Fed decided to hike rates by 25 basis points, bringing the target rate to 4.75 to 5%. In Jerome Powell's previous testimony to Congress, markets were prepared for the Fed to increase rates by up to 50 basis points. But then we had that thing, the banking crisis. So talk to us a little bit about how what's gone on with the regional banks here in the US has impacted the Fed's trajectory. Yeah, you're exactly right, Anne. So let's let's rewind a little bit. So in January, the Fed communicated very clearly that going forward, they're going to go 25 basis points and they don't know how many 25 basis points. Then, as you noted, inflation seemed to come in a bit hotter, the economy a bit hotter than expected. So Chair Powell, at his testimony before Congress, strongly suggested next time we probably are going to do 50 basis points. Mm -hmm. So I used to work at the Fed and so they kind of they're very subtle, you know, so when they say something like that, they're basically telling you we're going to do 50. But then we had all this excitement in the regional banks here in the US and that completely changed the calculus. So instead of 50, what we got is 25. Now, the big this part of the decision, in my view, was not so much that we just got 25. But there's a suggestion that this might be the last rate hike. Maybe there might be one more, but the Fed is suggesting that they're very close to the end of the um, hiking cycle. Now, that's very different from saying that they're going to cut rates, though. If you look at what the market is thinking, the market is thinking that the Fed is going to stay around here and later in the year they're going to cut rates. Now, that's not what the Fed is saying at all. Now, to your point about how the banking crisis affects this, I think it's useful to think about this from the Fed's perspective. So the Fed wants to slow economic activity, right? That's why they're hiking rates. Now, there's a lot of ways that monetary policy works, but one of the ways through monetary policy works is by mm -hmm. slowing credit creation. So right. let, me, let me break that down a bit. So let's say that the Fed hikes rates. Then what would happen is that if you wanted to go and take out a loan, let's say um, to buy a car or a house, well, interest rates are much higher. So you're less inclined to borrow, you're less inclined to spend, and then maybe there's less demand and inflation comes down. Right. But there's another way, though, that, um, that we can slow down credit creation. That's if the banks are under some stress, which is what's happening here. So when a bank is under some stress, it's reluctant to lend because banks, some of the regional banks are looking at what happened to Silicon Valley Bank and they're mm -hmm. thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't want everyone to come and you know, take money from me. I, I might be in a liquidity situation. So that's going to cause them to retrench a little bit. The Fed is thinking that this type of, I guess, retrenchment by some of the banks might be equivalent to, let's say, one or two rate hikes. It might slow the economy down. So that mm -hmm. means the Fed doesn't have to do as much as it originally thought. That's the logic that Chair Powell portrayed at his press conference yesterday. You know, it was interesting. I think I think Chair Powell maybe implied that it was equivalent to a 25 basis point hike to see the supply side constraint you just referenced, Joseph. Others who are commentating out there on the market have said this could be this being the tightening and the reduction in lending by the regional banks could be the equivalent of 100 basis points, which, which is perhaps a little bit too much on the high side. But Joseph, you've alluded in your comments right now to the idea that the market's expecting a rate reversal. Is that actually the case? Because if you look today at where the NASDAQ is, where the S&P is, they're actually in the red as the market's open. So are they really expecting a, a rate reversal or do they expect a little bit more hawkishness? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So when I look across all the assets, overall, my takeaway is that the market thinks that the Fed is dovish. So when I look at this, I see the tenure down. I see uh -huh. the dollar sell off significantly, right? So that's all consistent with what you would expect from a more accommodative, more dovish interpretation. But as you rightly note, though, the equity market reaction was a bit, I guess, uh, confused. At the press conference, it surged, and by the end of the day, it was down. So I'm not really sure what's going on over there. You would think, though, that if the market is thinking that, you know, the rate hiking cycle is over, rate cuts are imminent, 
equities would, would be would respond positively. So I think we should give it a few more days to see how that shakes out. Let's talk a little bit about inflation, uh, Joseph. When you, the, the Fed mad is supposed to be maximum possible employment at a 2% inflation level. And Jerome Powell did discuss throughout his confident, conference that inflation continues to remain high and the job market is still very tight. And there was just one quote I thought was particularly interesting um, and struck me as he gave his, his comments, which is, quote, the process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go and is likely to be a bumpy ride. Can you just talk a little bit about that? What is your outlook for the inflation trajectory and why will it be a bumpy ride? You know, I'm thinking Chair Powell was kind of having flashbacks from his January press conference when he was saying that. In January, he was saying disinflation, disinflation, disinflation. And then we got a bunch of hot data that seems to suggest that inflation was reaccelerating. So it was bumpy. It's not going to be all the way a smooth trajectory downward, but sometimes you have upward spikes. And who knows, maybe inflation hasn't even uh, really gone, gone under control yet. So my base case, actually, just not just for this year, but for the coming years, is going to be uh, persistently high inflation. Now, the way that I, the reason that I think this, well, there's mm-hmm. there's a couple reasons actually. And One, can you just it, define that, Joseph, before you sort of explain? Can you define when you say you are forecasting consistently high inflation? What kind of percentages are we talking about? I'm thinking we have about four to five percent inflation for the coming okay. years. So. When I think about inflation, there's both a demand component and a supply component. So high level inflation is when you know, demand pushes against supply, right? You have too many people wanting something and there's not enough of it. And we have very strong demand factors and we very have very strong supply factors, as in supply is constraining. Let's talk about the supply side first, because I think that's the biggest change that we're going to see in the coming decade. So over the past say a few hundred years, what we've seen in uh, throughout the world is a con- persistently increasing labor force. So population is always growing. There's always more people joining the labor force. But that all changed a few decades ago. A few decades ago, people started to have smaller families. And if you have smaller families, your population can't grow as much. So what we're seeing, not just in the US, but throughout Western Europe and even in China, is that the workforce population In the U.S., it's stagnant. In other countries like Western Europe and in China, it's actually declining significantly. So if your supply of labor is declining, then there's no way you can continue to produce as much goods and services as you did in the past. Now, some will point to technology and productivity, and that may be the case, but it's really hard to bet on that. Uh, For example, there have been huge advancements in places like computers, But if you think about aircraft, it still takes as much time to travel from uh, New York to London as it did, um, let's say, 30 years ago. In fact, they had that very fast Concorde plane, which they basically took offline. So it's coming back. It is coming back. back. In fact, by 2026, I believe, which is just so folks know, as the London resident in New York, that's a direct flight, which is four hours uh, from JFK to London. So that may come back, Joseph. All right. So we're having a little bit of progress there. <laughs> okay, so so what I'm pointing out is that you can't really bet on technology to save you because technology is uneven. But what you can absolutely bet on is demographics. And we just don't have as many people working in the future as we do now. And so there's not going to be as the supply of goods and services is going to decrease. Now here, now, now let's look at the demand side. The demand side, I think is going to stay strong because Um, there's going to be a lot of deficit government spending. Now, this may seem strange to to anyone like, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, what we're doing now. So 20, 30 years ago, throughout most of the world, uh, governments wanted to balance their budget. They didn't want to have too much deficit spending. But what we're doing today, though, is we're basically promising a lot. We're going to give a lot of free benefits. We're going to do a lot of, you know, green transition stuff. And that all costs money. So there's going to be a lot of demand. And I'm not quite sure that that, you know, there's going to be the supply to match that. And not just that, though. Another way you can think about demand is that people have more money to spend. So that's wages, and wages continue to stay quite high. So you're heading into a world where there continues to be demand from the government, uh, from from the households for high wages, and uh, there seems to be less people producing goods and services, the aging population, so to speak. So I think that's a combination for higher inflation. 
And Let's unpack a little bit more, Joseph, this wage inflation dynamic, because the recent data show that wage inflation, while still strong, was beginning to ease off from the peaks that we've seen. And then at the same time, we have seen layoffs, you know, frankly, grabbing too many headlines relative to the size um, they represent in the economy and the tech sector, but now spilling over into other sectors, financial services, manufacturing, and second waves of those coming through. So when you think about the near-term labor market dynamics, um, birth rate and population growth aside, and we should talk about immigration, wh what is your near-term outlook for wage, wage and inflation as supply demand adjusts? So wages are, are interesting because they're, they're, there's a very unevenness to what's happening. Now, yeah. so you're right that wages are coming down a little bit, but when I look at the chart, it looks like they went to Mount Everest and then took a small stick down. So it's still <laughs> quite elevated. It's still quite right. elevated. The picture in wages is something that is also new. And I, and I think we reflect some changes in sociology. So what we're seeing is that you have actually um, lower wage growth for um, high skilled people, let's say the people who are doing very well the past few decades, mm -hmm. uh, the bankers, the technologists and so forth. But the blue collar people, the people who work in construction, who work in the service industry, who work at restaurants, they're having very strong wage growth. And mm -hmm. I think you make a very you make a very good point that we've seen lots of headlines about um, layoffs in tech companies, for example. But I think of that as how monetary policy working to slow down um, the economy. So usually when the Fed hikes rates, it's slowing down the economy. And we would expect interest rate sensitive sectors like housing to take a hit. So we would expect lots of construction layoffs. That's certainly what we saw after the great financial crises. Right. But the strange thing that's happening right now is we're not really seeing that at all. What we're seeing is layoffs in the tech sector, which if you, if you think about it, is also an interest rate sensitive sector. So monetary policy this time is slowing the economy, but not in the same way that it used to work. It's slowing it by slowing down the tech sector. And I, I think that's much, I think that's gonna be okay because the tech sector people, they actually find new jobs fairly easily. So in terms of the human cost of higher interest rates, I think it's gonna be a lot less than the past. But going back to this broader sociological issue, over the past few decades, we've really devalued manual labor, devalued um, things like an electrician or a construction worker or someone who works in wielding. So we don't have enough of those people. So we have a real shortage. Now, remember, uh, let's say a year ago, we were all talking about truck driver shortages. Truck drivers are like 40, 50, 60 years old. And right. I, I can't think of many people who graduate college wanting to be a truck driver. So we don't have as many truck drivers as we need. There's a shortage of blue collar labor. So when you talk about wages, we're, we're talking about white collar people have white collar jobs, having more layoffs, lower increases in wages, but blue collar workers having a very strong labor market, very strong wage gains. So it's an uneven labor market right now. And I think that's going to persist because like I mentioned, there really is not a big supply of blue collar labor. We've seen Home, Home Depot increase their hourly wages. We've seen Walmart increase their hourly wages, Joseph. We've also seen state minimum wage increases, although when you look at that data, actually state minimum wages tend to be so far below cost of living. A lot of employers were already... You know, I, think um, that's a, I think that's a good, that's good thing, Ann. I mean, over the past yeah. few decades, these are the people who kind of kind of got left behind. Sure, it's, a, it's everyone who was working in the big companies who did really well. So it's a way, I guess, to redistribute income from the higher wage people to lower wage people. And let's say I care about the high wage people too, but they're going to find new jobs. So they're going to be okay as well. Let's talk Joseph too about some of the longer term productivity trends. You touched on technology, you said it comes in, in waves, um, sort of out of left field. But one of the things that has been getting a lot of attention is AI. And what does AI mean uh, to continue to perhaps displace some of the technologists or the financial services workers, that kind of profession. What's your perspective on that long term? Yeah, the things that I see chat GBT able to do are very impressive. And that does suggest that there will be some job losses. Um, but, you know, I think it's too soon, though. And, you know, it's also possible and that it creates new jobs. I mean, think about it. So once upon a time, we had typewriters and now we have computers, right? <laughs> That's a tremendous, tremendous productivity increase. But, you know, I don't see mass unemployment anywhere, everywhere. I mean, the, the people who are working on typewriters are fixing them. They found new jobs. So I think it's a bit early to see that. 
Joseph, just last question for you, which is to take a really big step back on monetary policy and, and zoom out of just the US, but look at what's going on globally. Um, very interesting data I saw recently suggested that at a global level, there actually has been continued quantitative easing, meaning more increases in the money supply, as opposed to tightening. Bank of Japan, for example, um, while rates have gone up, still seeing actually the supply of money increasing. Well, what do you think is going to happen now? We saw the ECB put up rates 50 basis points. The Bank of England just put up rates uh, 25 basis points. The Fed has. We're waiting for banks in Asia to come out and see what they do with their rates. Rates going up, a little bit of noise on whether the global monetary supply really is tightening right now. What do you think happens at a global level? So I think that we often think of the future, think the future will look like the past. And I've seen this happen many times. Right after the great financial crisis, the markets were all thinking that we would tighten rates soon, right? But we actually had zero interest rates for a decade. The market was thinking that, you know, post-GFC looked like pre-GFC. We're in a similar situation today, I think, where the market is thinking that the Fed will soon cut rates, global central banks will soon cut rates, money supply will re-increase, there'll be more QE. But I think there really is a regime change based on the fundamental inflation driving factors that I've discussed. That suggests to me that rates throughout the world, not just in the US, but throughout the world are going to stay higher than expected. Mm -hmm. And they're going to do quantitative tightening on a global scale. And quantitative tightening on a global scale will shrink the money supply. Now, some people are looking at, uh, let's say, temporary expansions of the Fed's balance sheet because of these emergency loans that they made to help yeah. the banks. That's really temporary. I expect that to reverse um, this week or next week. That's just a temporary emergency loan. The broader trend, though, in my view, is smaller central bank balance sheets, and that will contract the money supply globally. Joseph Wang, CIO at Monetary Macro. Thank you very much for joining us here at Public. And that's it, folks. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you all next time.